About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers of what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Thank you for standing for the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, y'all, what's up? My name is John. I have the privilege of serving as pastor here. If you're new to the Springs, you have no idea who I am. Been gone on vacation with my family. I have missed y'all dearly. I loved getting to go to other church gatherings while I was away. Man, I'm so blessed for the privilege of running with y'all. My family, basically what we did is we just took some vacation. We went to stay with family, hang out. We had a wonderful Time. I honestly want to take a moment, though, and give you a little bit of an update kind of on my family. I had the privilege of coming here September 1st. It'll be seven years, seven years ago. 
And kind of with the springs, my family's had the privilege of growing up with it. You guys have seen, I've got three kiddos, a beautiful wife, very blessed. And so I wanted to let y'all know while we were away, we decided some things. We found out some exciting news just about the family and what we want to do. So to let y'all know, this fall, I will be coaching Queen Cobra soccer. (laughs) Yes, yes. Some of y'all are like, I have no idea what he's talking about. It's a seven-year-old soccer team where I scream and my true coach coaches, but it's a good team. That shared, no, that's not the news. Uh, While we were away, my wife and I, Taylor, we found out we are currently pregnant with our fourth kiddo. Thank you. And and I know as I share pregnancy, the news hits everybody from those longing for the gift of marriage or even relationship or those wrestling with infertility. I just wanted to let y'all know, one, it's early, so would you please just be praying But here's the truth. We found that out. She tells me, uh, and in the moment, what immediately came true is this. I am a father of four. I am a father of four. Here's the thing, though. I have a seven-year-old. I have a four-year-old. I have a two-year-old. And I mean, guys, the jury is still out. You've been hanging out with me. But so far, I don't know, it's going okay, right? (laughs) I've been doing this thing kind of coming up on like eight years or so. So it's not that it's new, But when I found out that this was God's gift to us in this season, I was grateful and excited. And then I had this like pit in my stomach that almost felt like, do I have what it takes? There's like being a dad of one, two, three, four, and it hit me in the sense of, do I have what it takes. It was strange. It kind of took me back when I had the privilege, my wife and I were recently married, and we found out we were pregnant with our first kiddo. There's that moment that I just felt as a man, I'm almost like, I have to level up. Like, you ever had the feeling, even if you're, you're not married or you don't have biological kids or anything like that, like foster, adoptive, anything there, but if you had the moment, well, let's say you're going to go from high school to college and you just feel that sense of burden of like, I think I can do this. Or you go from maybe college to your first job or you feel the weight of the first job or the job loss and all of a sudden, the responsibility and the burden of life hits you and you begin to think, do I have what it takes? Can I meet this moment? I think your life experience, it may be very different. It may not be with a biological kiddo. It may be with a a career an illness, a, a, a tragic betrayal in a relationship, perhaps even a journey with God where you want him, but you still hold such deep resentment against him, you don't know if you have what it takes to draw near. I think the kind of ache that I felt in that moment is perhaps familiar to you in a way it's familiar to me. The, the reason I share that is I'm so excited. We are jumping back in our series through Acts. If you have been hanging out with us for like two years It feels like that. I don't know if it's actually been that. But we've been working our way verse by verse through the book of Acts. We'll probably be in another four, and I love it. But today, we're looking in chapter 12. Now, we have this chapter read over us, okay? Here was the massive picture. The massive picture is mounting persecution, opposition, oppression, mounting persecution against the church in Jerusalem. Now, what we're going to see in the weeks to come is we're really going to see God's miraculous provision. Most specifically, the text is going to focus on God's deliverance of Peter from prison. It's wild. And then God's judgment of evil. We're going to take this section, though, now that we have the context read over us, and we're going to break it out in chunks and try to understand it. The part I want to spend our time today is looking at the beginning. At the very beginning of this, I want to focus on Two men and their lives in particular. I think their lives are models and examples for you and for me. Because here's the thing. If you feel spiritually, do I have what it takes? Can I become, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, the man God actually calls me to be? Can I become the woman of love that I long to be? That ache you feel. Do you have what it takes to meet the moment? James is brought before Herod. Herod's the bad guy in the story, by the way. He's given a chance to deny his faith. James, by faith, had what it took for the moment. He dies rather than deny. 
And then Peter, if you remember the text, Peter's turn is next. He's sitting in a prison cell. Do you think he's sitting there frantic in fear? If you know the story of Peter, it's not his first time in prison. But Peter is there, and I'll show you in the text. He has every intention and a plan to die. You see two men living this life of such faith-fueled significance that they had what it took to meet and to match the moment. Are there areas of your life where you almost sit there and you think, maybe, maybe it's you in this current season, like where your family is, where you're like, I know what I need to be to be a dad. And I don't know if that's honestly in me. Or hey, hey I know what it means to actually follow Jesus through this season in college. I, I, I have the privilege. I just barely met this wonderful Young woman, lover of Jesus, graduating high school, about to go off to college, loves Jesus, been walking in the community, barely getting to know her, and it just felt in this moment. I talked to her two minutes. I just leaned in and I shared, hey, I just need you to know, you have what it takes to have fun and follow Jesus all through college and not destroy your soul. And this girl I barely knew begins to just put tears in her eyes. Why? The ache, the doubt mixed with hope. Can I make it? Like we even have language for what I'm trying to draw at and, and think about athletics. Like in athletics, when there's a moment of great trial or hardship and you need someone to meet and to match the moment. In athletics, we call it being clutch. My, my friends in college, a bunch of my friends were Jewish. We refer to this as chutzpah. Do you have what it takes to meet the moment. Don't get me wrong. I don't think anyone here will leave here and face the physical persecution of literal martyrdom by death with sword. But do you ever have moments where honestly the path you take is a path I've taken? Where unlike James, I would rather deny Jesus out of fear than experience a little bit of social death. Do you think you're meant instead for a life of robust beauty and significance. I do. Your God does. I think this internal angst of who is in me is universal to all of humanity. There's an author once that talked about it in a way that did resonate with me. The author, he's a Christian author. His name's John Eldridge. The way he's writing this, he's primarily, his language, he gears it towards men. I think it's universal. I think this is men and women. I want to share with you one of the quotes to try to describe what I'm getting at, because I think it will resonate with you the ways it has resonated with me. Again, the language will say man, but when you read that in your mind, men, women, this is every man's deepest fear, to be exposed, to be found out, to be discovered as an imposter, not really a man. To step back from it, I'm supposed to meet this moment. But on the inside, internally, I don't know if I'm capable. And once they realize it, then they'll see me for the insufficient person I've always felt myself to be. When I found out we were pregnant, I felt insufficient. The gap. Is that unique to me as a man? No, no. My wife... Four kiddos, she's sitting there in the same place of prayer, if not more, as me. Not unique to men, but common to humanity. John Eldridge goes on, he says, describing men, and again, men and women, I would say. Man, he is made to come through, to meet the moment. Yet he wonders, can I? Will I? I will give a hint. Unique in biological males, I do believe, and if that bothers you, come talk to me after. This is all about humanity, but man, this is true. It's in the heart of every man. I think it's in the heart of every human. But man, I think it is a unique thing. That shared, he goes on. Every man feels that the world is asking him to be something he doubts very much he has it in him to be. You ever been full of both faith and doubt, wondering? I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. The question put before us, do you have a life of faith to where God forbid? But if the moment James is brought forward, he is forced to kneel, it's in public, as we'll see in this text. And likely, 
The sword is placed on his shoulder and he's given the invitation. Hey, you can't have any other king but Caesar. You can't. Renounce your king Jesus, pledge allegiance to Caesar, and I'll let you go. And the sword rests on his shoulder. Do we have whatever it is to meet the moment? I think a lot of us have felt that almost sense of inadequacy or lack, ache, if you will, in our soul. Again, like, I know I'm supposed to be a man of God in college, and I know I'm supposed to love God and lead this way, but the honest truth is my soul's just drifting. I used to think I could, but now my life's been deformed, and now I'm hopeless. Or you're the, you're the one, and let's just, let's take a great example. Like, I think this is common. So many friends, hey, man, I'm going to go on a boys' trip. It's going to be great. And normally, it's just a really good time. And then there's that one night where the boys' trip becomes really a degraded, childish trip. And there's the night where these supposed men make decisions that are broken, tragic, and deformed. If you're a follower of Jesus, the soul. Christians shouldn't be surprised when non-Christians make decisions like that. They're not Christians. But when we do, there can be a confusion. And so you're there, and you want to be one of the boys. You don't want to be like that guy that stands out, but you honestly feel, I can't do this. This is not right for me. This is not who I want to be. So as the boys go out, you go back to the hotel, and in the hotel, you are haunted by the sense of isolation because you then know they'll talk about you, and you're likely not getting invited back. Do we have the faith to meet the moment? I think this is a universal struggle. I know in my life a sense of shame that comes when you want to, but you don't. But here's the thing, church. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, the vision of God's life for you it's not for you to settle in spiritual mediocrity, though that's often what we think it is. The vision of God's life for you is to experience such depth of love and intimacy that you're not fueled by some outcome. Will I meet the moment or will I not? You become the person of love who can endure no matter what. The question is, is how? How do you do it? How do I? If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, I want this text as you look at it, as we just look at the beginning of this, through really the character rhythm of their lives. The text will not explicitly say, this is how they died faithfully. This is how Peter waits in prison faithfully. But we will step back to look at the rhythm of their life to see how could they do it. I want you and I to see an invitation for my soul aches to be a man or a woman of such love that he makes me for the moment. It's who you are meant to be. It's who you long to be. Now, as a bit of a side note, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, we're so glad you're here. Or you're like questioning faith or you're out on this or your parents dragged you, your friend brought you. Well, we get it. Like, we're super glad. You could probably guilt trip them to where they'll buy you lunch or something like that. That's usually how it goes. Hey, I'll hold you hostage. You come to church. I'll buy you lunch. You want to do it? Right? Hopefully you get a free lunch out of it. Here's what I want you to hear. You're going to see two men, two men, and women did this for centuries. This is not just a man thing, but two men today who are willing to die for their faith. Now, these two men were part of Jesus' inner circle. To say it differently, they were really close to him. Folks have said that Jesus can't be true. He was just a good teacher. He was never Lord. He was a liar. And the people who helped him pull off the greatest conspiracy of all time were his inner circle, Right? You've heard this. I want you to see today there are two men who knew Jesus before he died, who literally examined his body after he rose. And they are both willing to die for him. Before the resurrection, they ran. After the resurrection, they stayed. And one today will die. You must live for a truth, but no one is willing to die for what they know to be a lie. So I hope what you at least wrestle with is two men who are historically verified, 
live such close lives to Jesus that they were never the same again. And if that's true, maybe the friend who brought you to lunch might be onto something. That shared, I wanna return to trying to answer the question for you and me before us, is do I have what it takes to meet the moment? Again, the moment won't be, I pray, as dramatic as the sword placed on the shoulder. But we all know the moments where doubt and faith are in tension, where you feel the spirit call you to something and then the flesh call you to shrink back. So if you would, grab your Bible and turn with me, Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12 is where we're going to be. We're looking at the beginning, verses 1 through 5. That's where we're going to be, verses 1 through 5. Again, we're focusing. The major picture of the chapter is the persecution of the church and then God's provision of it, mostly through the miraculous deliverance of Peter. We'll look at that in the, or next week and then in the weeks to come. But today, today, I want to focus on the rhythm in the lives of the two men in focus. It's Herod, who is the bad guy of this passage literally hunts them. Happy Sunday. I missed y'all. Acts 12, 1 through 5. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. So before he ever kills James, he perhaps killed, persecuted, threw in prison, tortured other Christians. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. That means the backdrop of this moment is is Passover, the Jewish feast of Passover. You're familiar with that. And when he had seized him, seized, that's violent language, laid violent hands, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him. Why are there four squads of soldiers? If you're familiar with the book of Acts, Peter kind of has this like spiritual Houdini ability to like escape prison, right? He's kind of been a part of like a prison break ministry in the past, right? And so he's a little nervous about that. So this is like top secret, most secure facility he can do, chained to Roman guards. That shared, we'll see more of that next week. That shared intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. See that language, bring him out to the people? He's going to publicly present him. It sets him up, which is historically verified. James was likely dragged publicly before the people, given a chance to recant, not, and dies. Peter, he wants to make a same and similar public spectacle of. Verse 5, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. James, a man who had walked with Jesus literally for three years and then spiritually for 10. One of the apostles, one of the inner three, big deal. He dies and his life gets one verse. Do we have faith to meet the moment? Now, as we try to answer, how do we do this? How do we live this way? How do we see the pages of the New Testament? Not as just, well, that was like a special time for them, or that's just about them, but that's not my reality today. How do we instead invite our lives into the narrative by the power of the Spirit in accordance with His Word to say, no, 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 I want to live a life of deep affection to where, no matter the persecution, come what may, it is well with my soul. James didn't just sing it. By faith, he'd lived it. Is it possible to go to college and grow in deep love, holiness, and obedience, and beauty, and have some of the most fun years of your life? Yeah. Is it possible to righteously advance your career without doing it for self-seeking validation while ostracizing your family, and then later in life looking behind you and realizing you wasted the best decades? Yeah. It's who you are meant to be. But before we can answer that, you first do have to understand this passage. Before we see how this text models through their lives, James and John, we first got to get it. I want to answer, though, historically and biblically four questions, right? Who's Herod? Why is he doing this? What happened to James? What's Peter's plan? You got it? Okay, we'll answer those real quick. Who's Herod? A.K.A. 
bad guy, right? Bad guy. That's, that's my translation. You're not going to find it in here. I just want to help you guys. Bad guy. Here's the thing about Herod. I got to give you a little historical background. This Herod's name is Herod Agrippa I. Now, if you're familiar with your Bible, Herod's name gets thrown around kind of often to where it can honestly be quite confusing. In the New Testament, there are at least four Herods that really matter. Let me walk you through those four. The one we're talking about today, Herod Agrippa, he is number three out of four. He had a granddad. That granddad's name, Herod the Great. Y'all remember the Christmas story where Jesus is born and then there's King Herod who tries to corrupt the wise, the wise men, the magi. I'd be like, dude, where is this baby being born? And then that King Herod slaughters what scholars estimate to be almost 2,000 Jewish boys trying to kill Jesus under the age of two. The Herod we're looking at today, that's his granddad. At his birth, he hunted Jesus because he feared for threat to his own kingdom and throne. Now his granddad, Herod the Great, had a son. This would have been our Herod's dad. We don't know much about him. Do you know why? He killed him. He killed him for fear he would take his throne. That takes us to Herod number two. Herod number two, this guy's name is Herod Antipas. If you're familiar with not just the incarnation, Christmas, but the crucifixion and resurrection, Easter, there's a Herod in that story. If you know, there's this guy named Pilate who like sends Jesus away because he, he's too cowardly to pronounce judgment. It's like this, oh, I'm gonna wash my hands of it. Sends away to this guy named Herod. Herod declines to pass judgment on Jesus. He won't do it. He won't save this man. That same Herod was our Herod's uncle. He's also the exact same Herod that beheaded John the Baptist. So you gotta think about this guy's family tree. Granddad killed his dad. Uncle killed Jesus' cousin, doesn't care enough about Jesus to help him out. So what does that mean for our Herod? He is a man of violence who comes from violence in a time of violence. Y'all heard the cliche, but oh so true saying, hurt people hurt people. If not, it's actually a really helpful saying. Have you guys heard this? Hurt people hurt people? Some of y'all are asleep. Okay. <laughs> They do that. That's this guy, but on steroids, right? So who is he? You got another historical context. He is the ruler over Judea and Samaria, but Jerusalem in the moment. That takes us to the second question. Well, why the sudden rise in persecution? If you've been tracking with us through the book of Acts, the church in Jerusalem, they had some problems years ago. It got bad, but it kind of settles down. And now this wave of persecution has come against them. Well, if you remember from the text, the text starts clearly about that time, about that time. Let me give you a recap. If you've been with us, here's what happened in the book of Acts. Peter, this Jewish Christian leader of the way, amazing man, became friends and spiritual family with Cornelius, this Gentile Roman oppressor. Jews are supposed to hate Gentiles. They're dogs, subhuman. Peter was to have nothing to do with this man. Yet they find out that these Jewish Christians are calling brother and sister these Gentiles, that they're being treated the same way and they're being invited directly into the family of God. Have you heard the evil derogatory and offensive racial slur, um, race traitor? You have. That's what was in their heart hearing that. The evil prejudice in the Jewish leadership hearing, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't get me wrong. They didn't like the Christians already. They were referred to as the way, these followers of Jesus. They didn't like them already. Why? They said Jesus was the Messiah. Like he's not the Messiah and it was upsetting all of Jerusalem. They didn't like them already, but then they hear, whoa, whoa, whoa. And now you guys are calling family Gentiles? The dogs? You now love and do with equality, dignity, what the world tries to divide. Jesus through his church unites. Well, two things have happened. News of this, has reached Jerusalem. So what are they hearing? There's this massive awakening. Like literally, there's this church in Antioch 
where like people are becoming Christians all over. It's like changing the whole landscape of the third largest city in all of Rome at this time. It's crazy. They hear news of that, they don't like it. And then they hear, whoa, 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 and you're doing this with Gentiles? How dare you? The Jewish leadership, all scholars think the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem resents this, hates this. And then you have Herod. Herod's in charge of Jerusalem. Uh, Josephus, he's a famous Jewish historian trusted by secular spiritual scholars, all the above. He describes Herod two ways, Josephus. He is a man of fear driven by opportunity. He's a man of fear driven by opportunity. Herod sees an opportunity to secure his political power in Jerusalem by ingratiating himself, by aligning himself with the Jewish leaders and saying, oh, you don't like this? Watch what I can do. Ever heard of political leaders without any form of real integrity, aligning themselves with a certain group to ingratiate or stabilize their base of support? I haven't. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. Shocking. So what are we learning about Herod? He's a man of violence who's insecurity. Literally, the text said, when he saw that it pleased the Jews, what pleased the Jews? That James lost his head. He's like, oh, you like that? Get me Peter. Peter is the proverbial head of the snake in his heart. All right, I'll get you Peter. Then you'll really like me. And he hunts the church. You tracking with me so far? All this stuff, by the way, you could look up history books. It's amazing to see how the Bible is true. Herod is a man of violence from violence in a time of violence, but also he's insecure. So he uses violence to seek popularity so he can expand his sense of political security. See how it all rhymed? Third question. So what did James do? It says he died by the sword. Now, historically, as well as according to church history, here's what we know. We know that means he was beheaded. He was seized, likely imprisoned, and then dragged in public and given a chance to recant. He didn't do it. Like, you get that? He would rather die than deny. I can remember, I was in middle school, and I went to a youth, youth gathering at our youth leader's house. And I don't know how, we're just talking about stuff middle schoolers talked about. He brought up the topic of like, hey, how do you want to die? How do you want to die? If you send us your student, we do not lead with this, okay? You can trust us in the sacred formation of their souls. That shared, how do you want to die? I, I'm, I'm new to the whole thing. I don't know what I'm doing. I won't become a Christian for like a little under a decade later. He talks about how the greatest way to go is martyrdom, martyrdom. And I can remember sitting there and thinking, and maybe he meant it, I don't, I don't know. But I can remember sitting there as a seventh grader thinking like, you have no idea what you're talking about. No idea. See, we all do hope that we would rise to the occasion. But the truth is we often fall. Let's just use the saying. We don't rise to the occasion, but we fall to our level of training. I want to somehow be able to rise to the occasion when out of nowhere I'm pressed on my faith and you can just tell they think less of me knowing I believe in God. Do you always rise to that occasion? We like to think we just rise to the occasion, but what's true biblically is we do not fall or rise to the occasion. We fall to the level of our affection for God. There's this beautiful line where someone presses someone on their faith and that he does not know what to say. And his answer is literally before this crowd that is pushing him, like, how could this be? He says, I have no idea how. And then literally and spiritually says, but I was blind and now I see. That's all the answer you need. You know how you get to that answer? Sense of affection. We're seeing in this moment, though, James, forced to bow, then beheaded. Now insert Peter. Peter comes and he's seized. Uh, Herod saw that it gained him popularity, so the popularity is like, oh, I got a source for this. You like my cruelty? Watch this. Puts him in prison. Peter, by all accounts in this text, he is waiting to die. Even the church, the people that are going to pray for him, they think he's going to die. 
Why? Remember when he came out when the text was read over us and he's like, yo, yo, I'm here, let me in. They're like, no, no, you're an angel. If they think he's an angel, they think he's dead. And that's a bad theology of angels, by the way, but I'll see you next week, okay? But you have to see in the moment, he's planning to die. He resolves in his heart to die. You think he was shaking? Ah. I'm sure he had some fear, but here's what we can imagine. Wasn't the first time he'd been there. The second, I love the narrative as we read it over us. Remember, he's asleep in the cell. This massive light shows up. It's the angel. The light doesn't wake him up. Why? Dude is in such deep, peaceful, rim-filled cycle sleep. The light does nothing. Like if you track your sleep score, Peter was getting 100. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) <laughs> literally the light shows up and the angel says something, dude's still passed out. So he has to like, kind of like kick him, like, get up, man. He like wakes up, he's like, hey, what's, what's happening? He's like, put some clothes on, dude. It's all in your Bible. I'm not making it up. Peter basically thinks he's like sleepwalking in a vision the whole time. Man, was it peace? Now, now maybe. The question is though, if James and Peter are so faithfully willing to meet this moment, how did they do it? How do you and I do that? Is it even possible? Is it real? Do they have some special blessing because apostles? Or is that the vision of what it means for you to be a father, a mother, to steward your singleness in glory and not waste a moment of it, to righteously define yourself more by God's love than your sexuality, to stop hiding behind the American dream while attending a service on Sunday and instead actually fall in love with God? Was it just for them or maybe for you and for me? How did they do it? Because here's the thing. If you know your Bible, they did not always have that in them. Peter's story is pretty famous, right? If you go back, and it's approximately 10 years before this moment, okay? So Peter's in jail. If you went back approximately 10 years before that moment, Peter, while being faithful, had a moment not so faithful, kind of strung a couple of them together. Like literally, he's kind of a coward, says, I'll never betray you. He totally does, runs from Jesus. That's Peter's story. It's fairly well known. What about James's? The night before Jesus died, Jesus put his, his buddies in a room, these 12 apostles. There's likely a couple more listening. And he tells them, hey, man, I'm going to die. One of y'all will betray me. Like, he sets the tone. It's serious. In the middle of dinner, James and his brother John find a moment where they're like, hey, hey, Jesus, Jesus, good talk, dude. Good talk. Do you have a moment? They're like prompted by their mother. Total helicopter parenting. I swear it's in the Bible. Go look at it. It's Matthew 23. And they're like, hey, 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 when, when the kingdom comes, heaven, yeah, we're psyched. Can we have the positions of honor at your right hand? These men that are supposed to be servants in that moment are fueled by selfishness. That's where this man was 10 years ago. Before Jesus dies, he's making it about him. Jesus looks at me and says, you have no idea what you're asking me. And then Jesus says, can you drink the cup? Henry Nouwen has a whole book on what it means to live a life of can you drink the cup. The cup for Jesus symbolized a lot of things, but in that moment in particular, it symbolizes are you willing to honor God and follow him no matter the cost? Jesus will go and in the garden talk about drinking a cup, honoring God no matter the cost. James looks at me and says, yeah, yeah, man, I got it. And Jesus says, you're right, you'll be able to. I think Jesus was speaking about this moment when James would die. James would leave that night. He'd go with Jesus. It's a famous story. Go with Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus would be in literal anguish. Like he just said, hey, betrayal and death is coming. I'm going to be torn from the Father. My Trinitarian union will be fractured. Will you pray for me? James is like, got you, passes out. (laughs) Jesus comes back, wakes him up like, dude, will you pray for me? Like there would have been a moment in between there where he would have literally seen the residue of blood sweat through Jesus' angst. Will you pray for me? I got you, Jesus. Passes out. Please pray for me. I got you, Jesus. Passes out. He did not meet the moment. You ever had a moment like that? 
I'll never again. I did it this time, though. And then eventually, you give into that same thing so many times, you refuse to commit again because every time you do, it just evokes greater sense of despair and self-hate. You think James knew that life? James in the moment, the last thing he will hear before Jesus is resurrected, he'll see him resurrected. The resurrection changes James's life, all of their lives. And the last thing he'll hear Jesus say to him is, hey, wake up. My betrayer has come. James will run with the apostles. It won't be till after the resurrection. This man, James, will live by faith in a radical and beautiful way. He didn't have what it took 10 years ago. So how did he find it for this moment now? Like, if you think about a bit of his, like, before the garden moment, he went from this man who wanted to use religion to elevate himself to be willing to die for his relationship with Jesus. Which means he not only saw Jesus as king because he had to acknowledge he's king to die. He not only acknowledged him as king, but savior. And then he knew him as brother. He felt him as friend. That his past didn't define him. The righteousness of God marked him. So how does he in that moment how does he stay there? Because here's what would have happened historically. He would have been placed down, like on bent knee, to be decapitated. Bent knee, bent over. So they forced him to almost like bow. Will you recant? We don't know where the sword was. Perhaps they placed it on his shoulder. Or maybe it just stood back. We, we don't know. But he's forced to likely kneel by all accounts, bowing. Like, will you recount? If he does, he gets to stand up. He stays down. How could he do it? He had learned to bow for a decade in love. How do you and I meet the moment? How do we become the men and women of divine and righteous, God-glorifying, not about me, all about him, significance that you're actually meant to live? Not, not settling for the spiritual mediocrity of South or Central Texas, but a vision of beauty walking with a king. How do we meet the moment? How did they? Here's what resided in their lives. Their love was greater than their fear. Their love was greater than their fear. For you and me to be men and women of significant faith, our love must be greater than our fear. Now, you got to stay with me as I explain this. James, he'd walked with Jesus three years, walked with him through his spirit and his presence 10. Love had been what transformed him. He'd known about Jesus, heard Jesus' teachings. He would even go back and relate to some of those teachings later. It was not a deficiency in love, but through the reality of the resurrection and understanding by faith and faith alone, I am loved, I am forgiven, I am chosen, I'm free. You are the son of God. Love overcame his fear. What motivated him to ask for a position of honor, insecurity, and fear? What motivated him to be a coward and fleeing with the other apostles? Fear. What kept him on bent knee? Love. Two clear ways. There's at least a saving love. Like through the resurrection, he came to really see you actually are God. I believe in you no matter the cost. And the second thing, he had oriented his life for a decade to know, experience, grow in, in accordance with the Spirit of God and His Word, the securing love of God. Peter lived the same way. It was not bravery that kept James there to die. It was affection. I have no idea, doubt that there was some fear there. Like, I, I'm not gonna like, you could make it seem like the last person we martyred was Stephen. Stephen's like viewing God. It really doesn't seem like Stephen was scared. So maybe James wasn't either. We don't know. The text is not clear. But I imagine in his humanity, there's a little like, man, I believe in you, but all right, let's do this. But was love the prevailing theme? One of the most famous verses on this that we're all familiar with, if you grew up in church, or honestly, maybe even if you didn't, 1 Corinthians 13, 
The Apostle Paul speaking to the church in Corinth, talking about how Christians are meant to love one another and experience the love of God. It's often read at weddings, right? It's beautiful. Next time you're at a wedding and they read this, I hope you think about James being de decapitated in love. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. But hear this. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. So now faith, awesome. Hope, awesome. Love abide. These three. But the greatest of these is love. There is nothing more transformative or powerful than a life of love. The way we become the men and women, you have to hear this if you are a follower of Jesus, that we are meant to be those who meet the moment, not in a performative way, but in a, I'm so in love with him. I ain't perfect. I'm gonna drop the ball. But here I am, Lord. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. The way we do that is love. Hear me. Training is good. Knowledge is great. They, in the words of North Georgia, they ain't love. Bravery is key. But it is not love. Love is meant to be the transforming anchor and power of your soul. It's fascinating fascinating. Even to step aside, if you don't believe me, this is true all throughout your scriptures. Like, like even the Apostle Paul, it's his kindness and affection that leads us to repentance. What brings about our life change of becoming more like Jesus? Understand the affection of God. He'll describe it elsewhere that we might come to know how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of God that we might be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. Affection fuels devotion. Our love must be greater than our fear. You know what's interesting? Even neuroscientists, by the way, they're tripping over this truth right now. Neuroscience has come, if you're familiar with this at all, and I know a bunch of you guys are, two things are being really shown. When you study the brain, the language that's been used is you can find attachments. You guys have heard that. Attachments. There's actually a Christian neuroscientist, pretty famous, his name's Dr. Jim Wilder. He describes these attachments, where psychology would call them secure or insecure. He says that they are called love bonds or fear bonds. Love bonds or fear bonds. He says people go through life mapping on, looking into the world, either motivated primarily through love bonds or fear bonds. For many of us, because of the fall, family of origin, pain, brokenness, we go through life mapping it with fear bonds. You know the number one command Jesus gave repeatedly? Fear not. He talks about how do you transform your brain your life, your soul, from a place of primarily fear? Is it stop thinking about it? Try something else. Do something different. Is it willpower? It's not what he says. It's replacing fear bonds with love bonds. You know what overcomes the doubt and the fear of your heart and mind? It is pursuing an understanding of what it means to not just in a moment walk an aisle and experience the love of God, but to commit to a lifetime of love with God. So if this is true, and I'm telling you it is, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, our understanding of this, I think for many of us, requires a massive change in our spiritual strategy. Okay, think about spiritual strategy. How do we follow Jesus? I think for many of us, that strategy, it's often, it is fear-based. Fear-based, here's what I mean. Don't do this. Stop it. I should never again, or, or maybe let's say, culture's coming against me. I gotta be ready to defend the faith and stand up for the things of Jesus. And usually, usually you're being a bully more for something that is political than it is biblical, right? Hey, one of these Sundays, I think second Sunday of September, come back, we're talking about the election. I can't wait, come back. <laughs> Right? Why are we not talking about it now? Because I got to do some acts for a while, but we're coming back. Right? So if you want to be offended, inspired, and get a biblical theology of stewarding the Christian citizenship in this world, I'll see you second Sunday of September. Coming back to this. Man, we are meant to live with a different affection. Our strategy is often fear-based. I, I, I can't, I can't um, smoke again. I'm terrified to smoke again. I can't look at porn again. I can't relapse. I can't do this. We're terrified to do the thing, and then when we do it, we feel terrible. What marks it terror, a.k.a. fear, the strategy based on fear? I, I can't come and commit to, like, Christian community and open up and be, like, sacred vulnerability. I, I can't do that again. Why? I've been hurt in the past, and I bet that hurt in the past, they'll hurt me in the present, and there's no way God would want me to ever again be relational hurt. Hey, 
I'm not saying they're real, but I'm saying your strategy is based on fear. We never, oh, you never had a dad to disciple you. A mom to nurture you in the faith. So you sit there and you look at your kids or you are now the adult kid and you feel, I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing. And in fear, you feel you are called by the spirit of God empowered to meet the moment and you, and you, sh you shrink back to where you perhaps have the high schooler at the dinner table asking really beautiful, fair, complex, nuanced, and doubt-riddled questions. And you don't want to meet the moment. How does that change? We need to shift from fear to a vision of love. What, what do I mean? The vision for your life, you are meant to be so secure with God that if your friends, if your family, if your workplace, if they mock your faith, you train your soul to say, I am still loved. He told me to count it joy. He said this would come. Of course the opening ceremony mocked the Last Supper. They don't know your God. It doesn't mean it's right. You want to be compelled by that love? I do. You want to be so secure in love that if and when you get the life-limiting diagnosis, you could actually say and mean it. I'm going to pray for miraculous healing, but it is well with my soul. I think James felt, I will get to see Jesus again before you, Peter. You want to be so secure with God that no matter what, you're still cherished and loved by him. So many of us think it's not really possible. It is. I, uh, my family, like wife, three kids, we went out of town to see grandparents. I had to stay because I have the privilege of coming back here and I was really excited. They go away. So yesterday, I had something that never happens in my life stage. I had an empty house for like eight hours, which is heaven on earth to a degree, right? Love my kids. Don't get me wrong, but there's a moment. I clean the house. I get all set up. So you know what I did? I did? I watched like seven hours of a sports-based documentary, right? Some of y'all were like, he prayed. He Jericho walked his neighborhood. That's a, those are good ideas. I didn't do it. I'll try, okay? We're all on a path. Have you guys heard of the documentary, uh, Welcome to Wrexham? Welcome to Wrexham? So some of y'all have basically Ryan Reynolds, celebrity guy, Rob McElhaney. They bought a soccer club, football team, in Wales, so think UK. Here's the story. How do they take a bad soccer team and get them promoted to be true, especially in the eyes of the UK, a professional soccer team? Now, the picture, it's all about sports and the effort and the investment and the hardship. And of course, they're, they're selling a documentary. There's this drama to it. How do we take them from here and get them to there where they can experience promotion? It's about a soccer team, but it's about a town. Literally, the last episode, and spoiler alert, they get promoted. The last episode, last episode, it's called Up the Town. Up the Town where they just tell all these stories of people who have pled and longed to see the soccer team elevate. Why? Because when the soccer team goes up, the whole city goes up. I'm watching this show, sitting there. It's at the end. They're telling these stories. They get promoted. And I'm like crying <laughs> last night. And here's what I felt God tell me. Now, I use that language. I don't want to over-spiritualize the moment. I don't want to under-spiritualize it. But here's what it felt. I felt the sense of the Holy Spirit saying, John, the reason you long for that is because one day, one day, that is what it will be like to be with me. Here's what I mean. This soccer team in this town had journeyed for decades of hardship, trial, struggle, pain, not knowing if they'd get it. And the moment they finally do get the promotion, there is this, oh, to use Old Testament language, we made it to the promised land. And I'm looking at that, and I'm realizing that is life. 
Life is a pursuit of joy in a grind of pain, wanting to become closer to God until one day, by faith and faith alone, you receive your promotion. And I just sat there and I thought, man, in your presence, I will be free. James had a vision of love with God that cultivated a sense of promotion is what awaits me. Not only did he elevate a beauty of eternity, but it changed how he lived the entire rhythm of his life here. You know how James was able to do that? It's not simply because he walked with Jesus for three years, but 10 years by the power of his spirit and communing with his people in accordance with his word, he cultivated an anchor in his soul of affection. He loved his God more than he feared the sword. So very practically, how do you and I become men and women who want to replace a strategy that oftentimes it's based on fear, where we just go through life avoiding all the things that bring us pain, but then we say like, no, 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 but I'm good, and Jesus and I, and I said a prayer, and I'm gonna go some Sundays. How do we replace this strategy with instead one of beauty, significance of righteous weight to it where we say I want to actually know love and go all in with God by faith spirit help me to proverbially burn the ships I'm coming home to you I want to start running that way now I have three quick thoughts for an honest way to experience in your life the first thing you have to do is believe you really got to believe, man. There's no way I would have been martyred for my faith as a seventh grader. Would I today? I hope so. I want to live well, though. So no matter how it comes, I die well. But you know where it starts? You really have to come to see him as true. It's forgiving. It's loving. You have to know him. James was transformed by faith. The second thing, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, how do you cultivate this life of beauty? The second thing I do really do think that applies if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, I think you have to learn the practice of prayer. What I mean by that is let's just say that this morning you'd come and it was Acts 12 and that's your quiet time. You have to come and through God's word, read this and then sit with God and say before him, what do you want me to know? And then learn to hear him. We will train you. The Holy Spirit does what's called illumination. The text comes to life. He wants you to know that. That's not something for varsity version Christians. And then there's you. This is the invitation to intimacy at a table your father has prepared for you. And the final thing I have to add, you got to believe, I do think there's an invitation if you're a Christian to a life of prayer. Third is, is community. James had run with amazing men of faith for 13 years. He and Peter had prepared for the moment long before together. You know what I love about the text? At the beginning, remember it says about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on those who attended some Sundays at a local church gathering. He laid violent hands on those who are like, no, no, man, I had an amazing moment. I've like been baptized and I'm good. But the church, man, I don't really trust y'all. You guys have kind of burned me. But I'm going to come when I can, how I can, on my terms. Wasn't what we came for. He came for those who belonged to the church. You will not grow in deep intimacy if you do not connect to his spiritual family. You do not have to do that here. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you have to do it somewhere. Why? When you get in a room, brothers and sisters remind and inspire. It's who you want to be with. We've looked at Acts chapter 12, just the beginning. 
The whole text, it's broadly like persecution and God's provision in it. But we saw today, two men, tragically, have the faith to meet the moment, not in a performative sense, but in like a heart of affection, this wild belief that God is better than anything. And we talked about, like, how, how could we have that? Is that really an invitation for your life here, 21st century, New Braunfels shirts, Seguin, Kenny Lake, wherever you're coming from? Is that an actual thing you could experience? Yes. How? Change your strategy from fear to love. Our love must be greater than our fear. There's no better example of this than King Jesus. Lord, let this cup pass from me, but not, your, but not my will be done, but yours. How did he stay rooted to the cross? It wasn't the nails. It was his choice. But what held him there? Love of the Trinitarian God he's a part of. Two, you. His love for you over came his fear of being torn from the Father. Was his fear real? The love just eclipsed it. That's what we'll celebrate now as you remember the beauty of communion. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the gift of your people and just what you do and how you change lives. Lord, would you come and now as we remember and worship through communion. Holy Spirit, change eternities. Help people to believe. And then God too, Holy Spirit, in the hearts of your church and your people, give a vision of, I want to really know him. Like make obedience this beautiful fruit of a life in pursuit of you. You are the one that we want. Would you remind us, stir us up, call us back home. All the glory to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.